everybody. It's my pleasure to um, uh, welcome you to our Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods seminar series. It's wonderful to see all of the familiar faces and a very warm welcome to those of you who have not been here before. If you've not been here before, we have a sign-in sheet. We encourage you to sign in. Um, that lets us know who's coming and how to reach you to let you know about upcoming presentations and talks and other sessions that might be of interest. It's also useful for us to track who we're reaching and who we're not and how we might reach out um, to broader audiences. But welcome to everyone. I'm Sue Flocky, and I'm an Associate Director at the Prevention Research Center for Healthy Neighborhoods. Um, and we have this session every Wednesday, um, second Wednesday of the month, um, every month except for August. Um, our upcoming presentations, I'll just give you a taste of what's coming. Um, in March, uh, we have Dr. Madalena Montefon, who's a postdoctoral fellow, who's going to present some of her work around feeding babies in the Andes and maternal ideologies and practice in the context of public health interventions. So that will be interesting. And then in April, we've got a presentation on nicotine dependence and perceptions uh, from young adults and adolescents who smoke little cigars. Um, and that presentation will be done by Elizabeth Antignoli. Um, if you have ideas um, for presentation topics or recommendations for speakers who you think uh, would be uh, good for this audience, um, please do send those ideas to me. Um, I would love to have a broad, um, a broad spectrum of projects that are going on that are prevention, health promotion related, um, and welcome faculty, staff, community partners, others mm -hmm. to bring to bring ideas to this venue so that we can have a really rich discussion. Likewise, um, if you look at this presentation and you think others might like this kind of venue, please share that. Um, all are welcome to attend. Uh, we usually have a light lunch. We usually have room for everybody. Um, some talks are standing room only, so come early so we can start on time. Um, and uh, we usually have a very, very good uh, discussion. These uh, sessions are recorded. So if you enjoy this and this is your first time here and you want to go back and see prior times, um, we are getting better and better with our technology of how we're recording these. Um, and we now have the PowerPoint linked in with the presenters who are talking. And I think that that makes for um, a, better, a better experience for reviewing it after the, the talk. Something else that is new for us is that we will be live tweeting <laughs> during this session. So if you have comments, thoughts, um, suggestions, questions, um, please go ahead and uh, tweet those. I will do it too, so um, I'll, I'll need some guidance, but I think that this will help enrich some of the conversation mm -hmm. as well. So with that, I am very pleased to introduce our panel of speakers today. Um, who will be presenting on community health workers models of success in Central. Um, we are really, really uh, fortunate to have uh, such a, a great panel um, in different perspectives um, that are coming to this. Um, first to speak will be Talian J. Thomas, um, who uh, many of us know through her service on our network of community advisors for many years for the Prevention Research Center. Um, she is currently um, at the director of the Foundation Center for Midwest, mm -hmm. um, which is fantastic. You've been there for five weeks. Five weeks. Um, mm -hmm. Many of you may have known her for her time with the Sisters of Charity, mm -hmm. um, in that, and she was in that role for quite a long time. She will be kicking it off. Uh, followed by Peter Witt, and Peter is coming to us um, from the Enlightenment Consultant Group, um, and he currently serves on uh, the Community Relations Board for the City of Cleveland. Yes. Um, and then bringing it home, that's right. Bring it on home, John. Is uh, <laughs> Joseph Black. Um, so uh, Joseph is um, uh, serves as the Cl the Cleveland Central Promise Neighborhood Engagement Manager for the Sisters of Charity. Um, so we're very excited to have this. Um, our aim is to have a presentation um, and then open it up for our discussion and comments at the end. Great. So with that, tell you. Right. Thank you. 
Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. I think I'm powered on here. Green light, microphone, great. Well, first of all, thank you for coming out. Uh, we know that the elements have decided to show up in full force, but it's a good thing. We live in Cleveland. It is uh, the Midwest, and we're supposed to have snow. So thanks for braving the elements, um, and thank you for being here. So I'm going to kick off uh, our presentation today, and we want to keep it as conversational as possible. Um, but being that there's three of us, being that there's a little bit of time sensitivity, um, we're going to try to make it so that we can take a brief pause if you have some burning questions after each individual um, presenter, but we definitely would like to have an engaged kind of conversation and dialogue um, at the end. So today's topic, as um, Dr. Flocky mentioned, and again, thank you, Sue and Elaine, for the invitation to be here. PRC is awesome, and I um, enjoy working with you guys over the years. There's three of us presenting today. That's our um, information. have to thank um, the numerous partners that were part of this project. So um, this work was not done in a vacuum. It took a lot of people working together and struggling through um, some pretty dynamic um, things that we'll lift up for you um, in order to get uh, where we did um, in order to plant seeds for future opportunities. Um, so these are the organizations and institutions, but what is not on this slide is a list of individuals who really were the core of the work. Um, and these are the residents who stepped up to be leaders, um, to expand their own learning and knowledge, to be able to reinvest back in their community and serve as community health workers. Um, we actually have one in the audience, Ms. Brown in the back, so thank you for being here today, Ms. Brown. Okay, so today, um, really the purpose of the conversation, we're going to use um, the model of community health workers um, to really share with you and explore some themes around um, tensions that communities and institutions face when really trying to implement big ideas. Um, what's exciting about this work to me is that we get to live in the, in the space of big ideas, um, but with that comes... Um, complications, complexities, but that's not a bad thing. We just have to be willing to face it and work through it um, in order to get the ultimate impact. So we're going to be as transparent as possible about our journey and our learning, um, and again, use the lens of community health work to share that with you all. So I'm going to ask a small favor for at least the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'm going to ask you to be in agreement with me around these three points. I'm not going to argue the points. I'm not going to try to convince you. I'm just going to state them with a period. And I want you to just hold them in your mind as we have this conversation today. So the first is that in Cleveland, it is arguably the best of times and the worst of times. The second is that community dynamics demand that institutions, organizations, and leaders take a harder or a closer look at our practices, the implementation of our work in community, and especially our values. And the last is that disruptive thinking is good. So, by way of background, how did all of the, the logos that I shared with you on the acknowledgement sheet, as well as all the individuals that served as community um, health workers, come together to do something big and central? Well, in 2014, um, Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital had reached out to the Sisters of Charity Foundation, where I was a former employee and served as the program director for health for seven years, and came to us and said, hey, um, we recently received some significant funding um, through CMMI. Um, we are trying to do some things around ambulatory care um, for uh, pediatric patients, and Central is a neighborhood that we're interested in working in. We know that you have a presence here. We know that you have a hospital. We've heard about this promise thing. Um, we really would like to connect with you and figure out how we can do some outreach in Central. So that was kind of the, the preset of the conversation. Um, clearly, as we know, this is a room of students and academics and researchers. Um, their funding was, was rooted and framed in a research study, so there was a lot of guidelines, um, expectations, theory, um, and, and kind of 
ideas that were going to play out over the next three years in terms of their funding. And so uh, some of the things that were specific to what they were hoping to happen um, specifically in Central uh, were objectives like increasing awareness around the health spot. Has anyone heard of that technology? I see at least one head. So we call it the spaceship. You might have seen um, similar technology in Rite Aids or grocery stores, but they're a telehealth medicine station. Um, this one in particular was kind of blue and gray. It literally looked like a, a spaceship, like if you walked into an arcade kind of thing. Um, but it was an opportunity where um, parents can interface with a physician um, if, their, if their child was having a non-urgent health um, um, issue. And so it was the being in the doctor's office without the doctor being there. Um, and so these are some of the other objectives around that. So as we begin to have a series of conversations with Rainbow um, to really, first of all, understand um, their purpose, their vision, and then the particulars of the research in and of itself, um, it quickly became clear that there were some tension points that were beginning to emerge. And the concept of just outreaching, i.e. marketing health spot in a neighborhood like Central was not really going to be the best platform or strategy to get community to connect to this resource, to understand it, to touch it, to use it, and to benefit from it. Um, so very, very early on, before we had even set foot, and I should also preface by saying, um, Rainbow had already been doing the work for about a year, year and a half, before before we were brought in as a partner. So they were learning a lot themselves. They had an outreach coordinator by the name of Rachel Hanna, who was a wonderful partner that worked very really closely with us. Um, they had the physicians on board who were serving in the telemedicine capacity. They had physician's assistants. They had already established a site um, at Friendly Inn within the neighborhood where the um, health spot was located. So they had already made some inroads around some things and trying to get the work um, underway. Um, and so when we came in about nine months to a year um, later, this is where we found ourselves, um, taking kind of an active pause to begin to look at these um, points of tension, if you will. So I just want to highlight a couple. So the first was partnership versus collaboration. I think this is a very, very important one. I think, again, um, very, very good intentions. I think um, the premise of the research was very admirable. It really was a conversation about um, appropriate utilization of healthcare, particularly in underserved communities. And so so beginning to turn the tide around ER utilization and really connecting families <laughs> to high quality health care access, particularly for um, pediatrics, and introducing a new type of technology that most communities, even in suburban communities, really didn't have access to at that point. But um, coming to us as the foundation um, with an invitation to partner versus collaborate really raised um, some questions, in term, both in terms of strategy, both, both in terms of capacity, and also in terms of outcomes at the end of the day. Um, there was definitely some uh, tension points. And I should also say that using the word tension, I don't necessarily want you to automatically default to something negative. Um, conflict is not bad. That tension is not bad. There's always for there's always a give and a get, um, and so for us, uh, it was really about just acknowledging these things um, and sitting with them for a while and beginning to kind of wrestle with them and figure out what was the best pathway forward. So. Rainbow Babies and Children sits within University Hospitals. The Sister Ch Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland is also part of the Sisters of Charity Health System. Two recognized organizations with very, very long histories in the community. Um, so we had to even figure out our own stuff as institutions. How do we complement each other? How do we defer? Some of you might remember we used to be like bound partners a long time ago. We shared and operated hospitals together, and, and some of that relationship had shifted. Um, there were, and then ultimately there was also the conversation about community versus institutions. So here you have larger institutions with an idea, great intentions, resources, wanting to achieve something, um, but didn't necessarily have that conversation up front with community. So how do you begin to strike a balance and work through that? Um, 
knowing that you have an objective and a goal, but you're trying to engage community um, and get them to buy into that as well. And then there's that. All right, so beyond the tension points, um, there's other kind of factors that come into play too. I call them challenges and opportunities because depending on how you look at them, they really, they really are both in. We definitely have the pressure of timeline, right? So this is a time-limited um, research grant. There were expectations from the federal funder about achieving certain um, outcomes at certain benchmarks along a three-year period budget. Um, while it was a very um, healthy budget. Um, not all of those funds and resources were dedicated to the work that we were asked to do. And again, because um, some of the ideas were developed prior to bringing in partners and collaborators, budget didn't necessarily match what was needed in order to accomplish the goal. Um, so there are some things we had to work through there. Capacity, who's going to do the work? Do you have that staff talent and skill already available? Do you have to find it? Um, how do you how do you strike that balance? Sustainability is this just about the grant in the three year term, or are we really looking to make some type of meaningful sustainable um, impact beyond those three years? The neighborhood dynamics, uh, organizational histories, collaboration, and a number of other factors. So. We learned some lessons very, very early on before we even set foot into the neighborhood to begin a conversation about health spot, pediatric ambulatory care, ER utilization, prevention. Before any of that happened, we had to sit with this. Um, and again, I'll just highlight a couple of things. Um, in terms of the collaborator versus a partner, I, I just can't stress that enough. And I wanted to share with you um, a definition of the two terms that comes from the Jewish, um, Jewish philanthropy. When they talk about partnership, they say to partner means to join forces in pursuit of a shared goal. Coming together in this way may or may not mean working together as equals. And partnerships may or may not mean welcoming others to share in the work. So it's really a more one-way exchange, if you will. I respect what you do. I respect the skill and the knowledge that you have, but I just want to tap into that function and not kind of engage you in the rest. Not necessarily a bad thing. We have a need. You find what you need to fulfill that need. Collaboration or to co-labor um, as equals with both or all parties involved putting in a commensurate level of resources and effort to achieve a shared outcome for the greater good. Furthermore, when we talk about collaboration, collaboration is defined by these equal parties joining forces to accomplish something any one of them working solo never could have realized on their own. So I think you hear the difference in the two, but one is not to say is better than the other, but it is important to determine when is it appropriate to have a partner versus a collaborator? Um, the last couple of things I'll highlight is the alignment bullet. Um, it's so important to connect the dots. Um, the work that we do, again, big ideas are being generated every day. Awesome intentions are constantly being put forward, but we have to realize that our work and what we're doing does not happen in a vacuum. So we have to look up sometimes and understand what's happening in the environment um, around us. In Central alone, you had the Sisters of Charity Foundation of Cleveland, um, Care Alliance that just opened, Cleveland Central Promise Neighborhood, a Cleveland School District Initiative, a Neighborhood Center Initiative, a Virus Prevention uh, Initiative. All these things were happening in this 1.2 square mile geography of a 10,000 plus population of people. And so to think that we could just go in screaming health spot and pediatric care and keep your babies healthy and that we could ignore the rest would be absurd. Um, so it's very important to think through how you connect the dots. Even though their goals might not be your goals, there's alignment somewhere and the responsibility is to find it. And then the last thing again, just on the point of disruption, um, it definitely can impact the overall benefits. So um, uh, 
RBNC's Rainbow's um, intention going in was to really be able to market or outreach health spot in, in these communities. And as we begin to understand their model and their theory, uh, we put forth the idea of using community health workers. This was a very disruptive idea in the context of their research. And I truly applaud them for um, taking in the idea and being willing to stretch and be uncomfortable for a good while because it wasn't like we just had a stack of community health workers that we could just activate like that. And you'll really learn about that journey through Peter and uh, Mr. Black. But um, had we not embraced disruption early, we would have ended up in a very, very different place. So stop there. I just wanted to offer two other examples of very large um, community-based um, models that are happening around the country that deal with these, these types of tension points. Um, and they've been pretty good about documenting them too as well. So if you have interest in kind of seeing who else is doing this work, some of them use community health workers um, within their models. Some use like resident ambassadors or leaders, but it's, it's a similar concept. So the California Endowment and the National Birth Equity Collaborative. So I'm going to stop there. Peter is going to begin to give you more of the meat, but if there are any immediate questions, I'll take one. One? Yes. 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 Can you be more specific in what, what that means to embrace the Sure. So I'll, I'll try to stay in the lane of research. So um, more times than not, the process, or you, you come up with your idea, you have your theory, you might have to seek your funding. And so there's a rigidity around how you're going to do what you're, what you're going to do. Um, as I had mentioned, from a time perspective, Rainbow was already almost a year, year and a half into the work. And they were um, playing out that work as they had laid it out to their funder, as they had, you know, articulated to their board and whoever those those were. Um, so, in bringing us into the fold, really the conversation was to for us to just kind of embrace what they were were doing, um, and we had to make a judgment point to say. We believe in what you're doing, however, from a value standpoint and also from the knowledge that we have about working in this community in particular, we need to, we need to adapt and make some, some, some adjustments. And in essence, those adjustments were going to be very disruptive, <laughs> for lack of a better word, to the path they had already went, were going down. Um, so sometimes disruption can, be, disruption can be minor in terms of decision points. And then it can be much more, um, it, can, it can be larger in terms of totally shifting and challenging your ideas, your thoughts, your approach. Um, so that's what we're talking about in terms of disruption. Does, does that clarify? Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thank you. Let's do it. All right. I'll go back. Yep. Technology. Mm -hmm. right, you slip the thing in your pocket and you want to walk around. Thank you. So you was very yeah, I was. <laughs> so uh, let me jump into this uh, for time. So anyway, I'm glad to be here and thankful to be here, and um, hopefully I'll impart impart with some informative things. So the learning journey. Um, I kind of start out with this slide for this purpose because as I think about the work of community health workers um, and what we were able to do in, in our partnership, uh, I'll speak about that, but I'll also speak about community health worker training and kind of community engagement in general. So you kind of have, I'll be speaking in kind of two, two parts here, but all of that is relevant. And I kind of say when I started my journey, particularly specifically around community health workers, it really was at St. Vincent Charity Hospital back in 2001. Uh, where I kind of implemented a community health worker model and actually was one of the first in Cleveland kind of doing the work. Um, but as you can see, um, my has expanded a, a variety of engagement strategies. Um, and even when I was at Cleveland State moving into looking at health equity. And so I bring that up because it, it kind of helps me set the um, tone for what I see when we talk about working and engaging um, folks, particularly community, as you, as you think about community health workers. So. Am I moving too fast? If I'm talking too fast, tell me. Okay. Um, so 
so when we looked at this, uh, Tony Andrew was dead on. I mean, thank you for setting me up. Um, and, and the very first part, it talks about having a commitment to central and sustainable change. So when you see uh, seeing equity as the outcome, not just the strategy, she really spoke to it very eloquently. And it's important to have people who are in leadership who can see that vision. And more importantly, people in leadership who can truly honor that vision. Um, I think it's easy for us to get distracted by opportunity, by money, um, and, and for example, had you not pushed back in that particular case, we might have just done a program, uh, but where we do lose out is, is having people begin to think about, well, what's the residue of that? So I just wanted to point that out. She, she set it up very well. Um, another key thing, and I put it there, is buy local. That's important, right? Just like foods. Um, oftentimes, particularly, you know, being a consultant for the past six years, I hear people coming in from out of town, they, they're hired, and I think it's great, but I think the disconnect is when you again think about sustainability, right? Depending upon what they're doing. So even if you buy outside of the city, right, like buying our foods, <laughs> I say partner with someone or an organizational institution where that is definitely carried forward. I think it's, a, I think it's an important fact that we often overlook. Um, and on this side here, uh, and this is again lessons learned, uh, residents and staff value training as a tool for engagement beyond short-term outcomes. So one of the things that we know in Central particularly, and most neighborhoods, particularly urban neighborhoods or I would say disenfranchised neighborhoods, is that that investment is far greater than just the project itself. And we'll talk, and you'll probably get a better sense of that as we move forward. So one of the things that over the years I've kind of come to understand and based on my training is looking at training and when I approach the training, particularly for well, a lot of trainings, but also for uh, what we did in Central with UH, was looking at the interpersonal perspective as well as the interpersonal connection. And that is a polarity to manage. That's interdependence. Um, and that is something that if we look at it as a whole in all our work, we we'll probably do a lot more, lot better with understanding how to connect with people, connect with institutions. So the ones that I want to kind of point out are identifying and appreciating their gifts and talents. I think any time you bring a group of people in the room, I'm, I don't know whether they're a community health worker, whether they are individuals like today, you really need to appreciate where they're coming from. That's tremendously important. Um, and then I think you need to connect in their work to others, both locally and nationally. And this is also a very important factor, at least what I've kind of realized, because we do not honor what has happened before us, and we do not necessarily uplift, for example, those individuals and communities who's doing the work. We'll go in and say, hey, this is what we need you to do, we'll do it. But what they don't realize is that Chicago, uh, and they're connected, you know, when you think about this bottom side, on a national, in a national network of community health workers. Now, the one thing that I will say is, um, I think we often get caught up on language. And so, for example, Tanianji alluded to the fact there's another model out there, and, he, and I think you said resident ambassadors or something to that effect. I would tell you, or venture to say, based on my exposure, particularly early on working with at APHA, working with the Community Health Worker Spirit, now section, um, resident ambassadors, outreach workers, whatever title you may use. Um, and if you really look at the definition of community health worker, now that they put in their uh, labor statistics, it is all encompassing. So I think one of the things we cannot necessarily do so much of is get caught up on if it says community health worker or not. Now, what is that battle about in Cleveland? It may be because we have these what, large healthcare institutions, um, you know, looking at how they what, distinguish themselves. But if I had to look at that history, I said, man, they took the, the turn of patient navigator right out of community health worker. Mm -hmm. So you got to also know the history. Right? So that's important in the work that you do. But this same history that I'm talking about here is so important to part with those individuals and communities that are doing the work. And the reason that's important, um, particularly when you look at the term, see me and help me, sticks out for me because I think oftentimes people in community really want to be appreciated and we want to see them fully, so we want to see their gifts and talents, right? And they use it, and they really want the support. The other part of that is, at least the way I do, is if I help you, then you're helping others. So help me help others, right? And oftentimes, that's their message, right? I do want to be better at what I'm doing. And so when we looked at the work we did, and I'll get to that in a minute, um, we had to look at all of that in terms of what we do. Last but not least, nurture and love, right? Uplift. Well, that seems simple. But I'm going to tell you, um, how many people have a child? Raise your hand. Are they old and young? Good. How many people has a niece? Someone, little one. Well, I'm going to tell you, that is not easy. 
Uh, so when, just like that child sees you in your room and they see how real you are or not, they'll call it out, right? Just by the way they interface with you. They're like, oh, he's, their energy is just not there, right? So, you know, kids, kids get it. And um, I think we lose that as adults, right? We get a little stale. We lose our well, effective, not effective, but effective opportunities. And when you're engaging, working with any folks, particularly talking about developing who they are, the real of who you are, how do you want to change yourself, and how do you want to connect with others? You have to be able to connect to them through sincerity, through love, and appreciation. And you have to nurture that. Now, can everyone do that? And this is where I talk about training. No. Every trainer does have the capacity to do that, but I'm going to tell you, that goes a long way. Most importantly, can you even hold the container? Because when you begin to do that, you are opening up something in those individuals that may be very sensitive, it may be very hard, but you're moving them. So we'll, we'll kind of come back to what, that all, what that's about, um, but I think that's a very important part of training that's missed out and in a lot of what we do in the work in the field. I gotta keep track of my time because Joe is up next. <laughs> um, so as we think about, again, just a couple of key points here, uh, when I talk about the self and others and nurturing that, and this is interesting, managing interpersonal conflict and promote collective opportunity. So even with the framing, and, and I know uh, Joe will probably do a little more on this, but even in the framing of working with the community, there, there's conflict. And so that mirror, or that, 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 that not even mirror, that system that, that impacts the whole, it just matricles down, mm -hmm. right? So if you got leaders of conflict, so you got community members of conflict. So the key is how do you have them understand the bigger picture and take an and appreciation for that? So if we can keep our eyes on the prize, for example, we can manage our conflict better. But that means you have to have a common ground and a common core. And if you're not able to establish that in the beginning, with purpose and intention, you're going to have problems. The other thing in managing conflict is you have to actually address it as the leaders of the project. So for example, when you're working in the community for a long period of time, and you see some real dynamics that a community person may have that's disruptive and not so good away, why I'm going to use your language, you have to be able to manage that. And it's not to, the, to neglect or negate that person who may not even know what they're doing, but it's to support them and uplift them in a way that they can kind of be part of the whole. And if you don't do that, you, you really do things. Again, that's key. So coaching comes in play. Um, and coaching for me is something that I kind of instituted in my later trainings based on lessons learned and also just me getting certified in coaching um, in a way that it, it not only is about coaching professionals, right, because we all can use a coach in here. I'm sure every one of you <laughs> can use a personal coach in here um, because we all have something we're working on, right? But when you think about the necessity, again, of moving people forward, we have to think about that. And this is, again, in a whole, as a whole, when you think about community health worker training, so moving it more specifically to the health spot, and I think you alluded to it, but there were some clear things. We know we needed to look at what the health protocol of knowledge and community experience of knowledge, right? And so we value the things. What's the, what exactly is the spaceship, right? How does it work? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So they experience that. More importantly, when you think about the protocol, well, what, is, what does it mean to come in here? We need to know exactly what that is so we can articulate the right message. Um, you have to talk about to understand technology and then that is supported your ability to do that. Tell the story specifically on the health spot. So you have to experience it, you have to know it, you have to know what pediatric what emergency is, so you have to understand what some of those dynamics may be if someone will say, hey, I'm going to take my kid because of this. And um, I'll just say this, because again, I know Joe's going to do all the, all the heavy lifting. <laughs> We have to really have, we have to understand why that was valued and not just kind of walk out there and say, go to this. Because that, this, that was their frame of thinking. Uh, because if I just come to you and say, hey, go to this, you're going to say, for what? And then if you can articulate particular things that may be happening with you and that your child is health related and give them some level of detail and comfort, then guess what? If a tough question came, what? We need a backup, right? We need that person to like contact.
be up here because um, I feel like I'm uh, talking fast. Okay. Organization all community success. So some lessons learned, right? And let me just say these, these are not lessons learned necessarily with only the UH project, but just over the years of doing the work. Um, support the agenda, then yours. So when you are engaging community at any level, whether it be a conversation or whether it be a community program, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 10 years, you really need to start with them. Your agenda is not as important as their life. That's a powerful statement. And not to be underestimated. Because the interesting thing about partnerships is that your life is the work that you're saying, hey, look what I got. Look at me. That's your life. But the life that you're interfacing with is much more deep and there's a lot of things that are going on. So investing in them is huge, right? And that investment can come in a lot of shape, forms, and fashion, um, and it's far greater than the project itself. And I would say this is a movement, not a moment, plan beyond today, right? And that's just, just saying, again, as you think about communities, um, no matter if it's, you know, let's look at this. I'll give you two very diverse communities. If tomorrow somebody said, let's go to Tremont, Cleveland, Ohio, which has been a very gentrified community with, what, 200, $300,000 homes, and we want to do a community health worker program, right? I guarantee you, those residents of that community, right, is going to say, wow, and amazed by that program. And you might be wondering why you're over there, because it looks like y'all got everything covered. But I guarantee you they will come out with some, somebody will talking about their dog. I love my dogs, and my dog is my life. Somebody will be talking about planting gardens, and gardening is my life, right? Somebody will be talking about I jog every day over the civilizations to get coffee, and then my, my yoga studio is around the corner, and I got a fitness studio, but that's their life, right? And it's so far greater than saying, we just want you to talk about health. They say, I, I work, but you know, when I come on, this is really what makes me, this is what makes my world go around. So it's no different, and I stay on this point a little bit, because when people are in communities, and let's look at it another way. It's not Tremont, let's say it's Central, Huff, Glenville, East Cleveland, Cleveland, places that are disenfranchised with no opportunities, or I should say, less opportunities. And here it is that they're feeding off the passion that makes them tick every day, whether it be poetry, whether it be a dog, or whether it be anything else, it is more intense, or at least I should say, it is a need to work with them more intensely about how we sustain and support their passion, and then connect it back up to the project. Making sense? Because that is longevity. That is what makes the world go around for most of us in the room. But we have a tendency to overlook that very important factor when we have a program in place. Celebrate, acknowledge success, and keep going. So of course, if you're thinking long term, you should celebrate at every turn. You should acknowledge the success of individuals, and you should keep going. I know that's my register. Thank you. <laughs> now, last, well, a couple more slides, and we'll be good here. So I think our work is always viewed as a problem solving. This is kind of based on, you know, my evolution, my own training as I bring new theories in and as I work with people, folks. But nothing, it's a problem solved, but more importantly, it actually is a polarity in everything that we do. And again, Tony Anji alluded to that when she talked about tensions or balancing. So, you know, clearly if this is a community member, right, or once, oh, by the way, if a community member is looking at this, they'll see both things, maybe one. If someone is a program person, they may say, look, we're really over here. We're just trying to solve this problem, particularly researchers, right? Because you use a the hypothesis, and you say, look, this is what we're going to do, right? Or even if it's a healthcare institution, right? But the reality is we have to pay more attention to the dilemma that we are facing. It is in us. You inhale, and you exhale. But you cannot do one or other, right, long enough without feeling some tension, and at some point you're going to let go. The key though is that when we do our programs or getting funding, it's a short span. The time frame is 18 months, the time frame is three years. And you fall over in this problem, so, and that's all you focus on. We'll look, look at a slide in a minute, kind of point that out a little better for us. So, bottom line, and I'm just going to run through this, right? This is our left brain. We see the trees, we get overwhelmed by the details. Then we what? See the forest, right? But the idea is to be in the upside. So what I would say, looking at having the capacity to both work right left and the right brain. When you do a structured programs from the beginning to the end. But again, who's on your team at the beginning? And what value do you have for them? Left and right brain. See the trees and see the forest. Last but not least, almost. 
right? Organizational outcomes in general when you're talking about community engagement, equity, and or community health worker programs. So you look at the organization, and this is say, the upside of that. These are the outcomes. Leadership, right? They're doing well. The organization recognized they really, right? Leverage resources, do more, and guess what? They are now writing new theories and best practices, and there's benefit to that. And guess what? They feel good, right? If I'm the PI on that, I have just taken about three trips and put them somewhere else, mm -hmm. right? If I am one of the people that's on a project, I'm like, oh, hey, what about me? Now, who's winning in that battle? Because sometimes in the planning of this, this is all we see. Then we have the organizations, that, this is what they're concerned about, this is their fear. Oh my gosh, we're not going to have any really new thought leaders coming out of this. You know, the investment is going to be low if we don't do it right. And you know, little to no recognition contribution to the theory practice in the field. That's what they're so concerned about. And I put community trust in there because you notice nothing about the organization talks about the community. Now let's think about this from the standpoint that even when you look at the hierarchy, and I'm going to say this last thing, but I like to point around saying, hey, how do you shift, right? So when you think about the hierarchy of research, the hierarchy of healthcare institutions, that most organizations in general, and I know we're in an institutional research, I worked in one, okay? Guess what? The symptom, right, that trickles right down. So when you develop your team, you're not necessarily thinking that someone holds another level of expertise. You're training as a, a researcher or a surgeon, anyone, so you, you're problem solving. But to expand that, you have to also think differently. And that's some of the tough challenges we have when people are conducting or putting together projects. You know, you're supposed to be that person. So I'll move it forward because I'll get caught up and then Joe will be like, man, hurry up. Um, now, let's look at the community success. And here's the idea of what
applies to everybody in the room to me. And that is this. If you if we are courageous enough to advocate as individuals and create many movements in our space of influence, we impact the whole. I mean, that be courageous right now, right? It's really, are you courageous? I've worked in higher institutions of higher education. I have gone against the grain as being a non-PhD, you know, running a million dollar grant. And guess what? It was some dead on fallback. It was some people who didn't like that. Because who am I, right? The will that you have in your hearts, and this is my message to you, everyone in here, particularly if you say that you want to move up the ladder of action. Sorry, you can't really read that. <laughs> that is it. Intro, when you inside, what are you doing? This is about the individual action you take. And so that individual action runs all the way up in terms of your department or your neighborhood. So this is not just for what people in organizations, this is for people who work in community too. So that individual action impacts organizations, it impacts Cleveland, the country, it impacts humanity, it impacts nature, and it impacts spirit. And you have to take it all the way up there, and please forgive me if I'm offending someone when I say spirit. Because if you don't really have it in your heart to see the change that you're looking for and you're only about your own self-fulfillment, because you need to be the top person in whatever it is that you may be doing. And you're not necessarily focused to some other than around the other, then you're going to fall prey to not being courageous. You're going to fall prey to the first person who is above you in authority and says, this is it. I know that's a tough place to be in, but when we're talking about making a change that we want to make in communities, and you're talking about community health workers and equity, then I'm going to say make sure you have the right people in front of them. Be thankful for the advocacy that people have leadership levels and have that and be honest with yourself. And try to make the difference in the way that you truly see an ability to change the system. But most importantly, we're probably operating right here, right? before you give me way up there. So please, don't go up there and come back. Because if you're not talking to your neighbor differently, there's a problem as a community health worker or a neighbor. If you're not in the, the department saying, you know what, we need to do this differently, and guess what, I know there's going to be some things here. We're not going to reach that plateau that the university or the hospital wants us to reach right now. But we know that this is the balance we need because five years from now, guess what, that's a short period of time. People are going to see us differently. Now you're making a difference. So, Joe, I know, I, I, I know. I'm going to stop, come on up, and thank you. And I'm going to let him come straight in. I don't, I, I, can we spare the question towards the end because of the time? I just want to make sure he has ample time. And I will stick around if I need to. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Taliyanja. Thank you, all of those who were present. Um, clearly, they laid the foundation for where we're at right now. And as you can tell, that there was a lot of legwork that was put in. We're talking about years of planning, training, education, all to get us to this point. Implementation. Okay. So, as Taliyanja requested, I'm also going to make a request of you. Imagine that you're in my position. Okay? So I am going to walk you through my, some of my thinking and some of the practices that brought us to where we are currently. Okay? So here it starts. I walk in on my third day of work. Okay? <laughs> Literally, this is where we're at. And I was told, hey, you know, you're responsible for all the projects that Telianja mentioned. Engagement, you take over the neighborhood, lead the way. Walk with the, with the people and guide them in any direction you so choose. But as you do so, here's one of the projects we want you to lead. The community health workers. So they say, listen, they went through training, and now we're at the point where we're going to have you work with the residents and lead them to get people to utilize. So as Peter alluded to, we got the training component of it. And he mentioned very high level on some of the ideas and concepts that they were trying to include. But what it came about in terms of the actual engagement of the residents is a vision that is not just about myself, it's about the community. And it's about the role I play in the community. And so we were giving these residents an opportunity to learn some basic things from public health, conflict management, all team building and educational practices that they'll be able to utilize within the position.
that then led to us identifying that out of these 10 residents, we're looking to hire five, and that is when I walked through the door, okay? So I mentioned day three. Day three was the first day of our interviews. Literally, I walked into the job, I was told, here's the project, you're gonna be collaborating with university hospitals, we're looking for someone to serve as a fiscal agent, and we're gonna actually get some residents out in the community, and they're gonna increase the utilization of the health spot. So we're saying, raise awareness of telehealth. First off, Joe, figure out what telehealth is. <laughs> Secondly, promote utilization of the health spot. Then we're going to go on to build the capacity of this team that you have so that they can do the things mentioned above. And also, let me tell you, you're only limited to ages 2 to 18. So, as I say, stated, we have the framework. Day three, we interviewed the residents, which was a, a very elaborate process. We were able to identify five. We identified that Burton Bell Carr would serve as the fiscal agent, so they would be the group paying the individuals when they go in the community. And then we're going to move forward to continuing our relationship with universities. So universities are going to support the team. They're going to be able to continue the outreach. And we're all going to come together. Oh, and by the way, this is going to end by 12-31-2014. So, you have to the end of the year, and I didn't mention, but it's June. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> so, but we are, our intention here is to find a way to make the puzzle pieces fit. So, once again, as I stated before, you have my theories about how to manage the project. And how does this come together? How do we lock these concepts in? How do we look at the community and the individual? And so what I really wanted to drive home is this institutional alignment and then self-sufficiency. And so as I began to work with my residents and I began to identify how do you build their strengths, how do you build their capacities? Well, first off, it just comes with basic team building skills. So what is our team? What are our strengths? What are we looking for? How does that support the ultimate goals? In the same instance, while we're doing that team building for the individuals, we're also doing that team building for the institutions and the partners. So what is the role that I play with the university hospital rep? How do we coordinate and manage our efforts to drive this vehicle in a direction that's going to create substantial change? We're also looking at how do all of us come together to where this is effective in time and manageable in terms of time. Because as I mentioned, this is not my only project. And the responsibilities within the duty were very time consuming. And so how do you invest the time that's needed to build the individual, but to also help build the community? How do you get the community to trust in what you're doing? And how does all of that come together to create change? What did you mean by delegation? So particularly when you looked at the framework and what we were tasked to do, 
we're trying to identify how do you truly ensure that people are maximizing their efforts. So what I mean, for example, is when the UH representative, which is mentioned as Rachel Hanna, her focus was going out to an events, pushing numbers. Well, how do we get her to do some more things on top of that? How do we get the community health workers to envision that it's not just door knocking, but there's other duties within it from data collection? And how do we build our team and make sure the workload is spread, shared equally? Okay. So, one of the other things that we have to do, what is engagement, what is our community? What does it look like? So in the red, we have the parameters of what is identified as the promised neighborhood. Okay, so this is the area in which I'm responsible for. The red dot there indicates where the health spot actually was located. So as you notice, this is the 55th section, and it was closer to 55th. But the needs of the community extend all the way to 22nd, if not further. So how do we mobilize people that are at the other end of that to engage with something? Now, this community is often divided by natural things. So your housing is in this area. Your, your grocery store is over here. I think it's the main So, our engagement strategies. When we went out there, happy, chipper, and ready to make change, we said that, you know what? We're going to attend community events, we're going to do some door knocking, and then we're going to distribute flyers. That was a simple idea of doing so. But there's also deeper details into doing that. And so we began to dive in, and some of that came by, you know, just working it out, coming together, and figuring out what worked for the team. Some of our individuals had stronger strengths of doing door knocking. Others felt more comfortable at events. And how do you manage the skills of your team to get them all to make change? So, that brings the next So that all, all our hard work, all our determination led us to these outcomes. These are some of the results that we see. So the community health workers worked 973 hours. 
So when you look at that, when we're saying the average income is slightly under $9,000 for a household in the neighborhood, and you're saying that these people are working total collectively 973 at a little over $13 an hour, that shows that we're making just an impact on, on their livelihood. We're also talking about face-to-face -face interactions. So within the door knocking, these are the results that we were able to produce, including the events that we had listed and also the health spot visit. So keep in mind that the health spot was active and, and going on before they got in the community. And these are the numbers that they were able to produce once they got involved. So here are some numbers just to follow up with that. This is specific to outreach. So we're looking at how many face-to-face -face contacts. And so on the far left, you'll see that you have the outreach coordinator. That is the university hospital representative. So this individual, prior to us coming on, had worked in you know, January, February, so on and so forth. And those were the numbers of one individual. We were able to come on. And then we were able to produce certain numbers such as this. Now, I noticed that you're wondering why is there such a spike in September. It had a lot to do with some of the back to school events and different activities with school. So that was a high peak period when we had a lot of kids that were out and available and trying to get as much information as possible to their parents. some successes. Now those were just the outcomes that I mentioned, but the successes in my mind were that the staff, when I originally took them on, there were barriers that we faced in terms of team building and individual growth. So these, this group was able to develop their own independence. They were able to increase their education and understanding not just of health, but as the community as a whole. So there were a variety of different learnings that came about. We're also looking at employment opportunities. So this was a resume builder for some, something that they can attach to and get them back in the workforce and get them back moving in a direction that they felt would be sustainable for their own individual lives. All right, so that brought us to December. And so UH had some time left available and we had some money still. And we decided, hey, let's do another six month stab at this. So we went back out. We were going to go from January to July. But there would be some differences. When I mentioned some money, that meant half. <laughs> so <laughs> what we're looking at is, is now instead of 40 hours a month, now we're going to 20 hours a month. And that does have an impact. That has an impact on what events you can attend. Because if you're looking at five hours a week and an event is four hours, you utilize all your time. And that event may not produce the numbers that you need. So we decided with the changes in the contract to try a different model. So we internally went about and identified different ways to approach the community. Instead of us just using a large engagement plan where we're hitting every house and door that we could, we said let's shift it, let's mobilize, and considering the weather, because now we're in January, let's find a way to get people active in areas that they may, may be more conducive to the weather and time. So we identified five areas in which one resident would be responsible for that individual area. So one person would do events, one person would do institutions. So we're talking like high level meetings, we're talking about meetings with CMHA, CMSD, to engage those people and try to see if we can get institutions to support the work. So now the community health workers weren't just the carriers of the information, they're trying to educate others to expand their network. We're also looking at organizations. So how do you go into Friendly Inn and utilize some of the resources that exist on Friendly Inn? We're talking about the schools. So instead of just having an event about a back to school route, how do we ensure that the nurses in the schools know about this so that when they diagnose a kid or send them home, that they're also saying, this may be appropriate for the health spot? <coughs> so, our approach led to these type of opportunities and successes. So we're looking at linkage. So as we began to integrate our work with more partners, we began to build their capacity to engage with the partners. And ultimately, we led to different canvases with some of our community partners. And it also led us to opportunities to expand our scope of work. So we weren't just looking at central, we were looking at the larger scope of the city and how what people are traveling through the neighborhood and what people are traveling out. Oh, and not to mention, I'm sorry, but resume development. So also looking at the, the fact that the contract is ending soon brings us to the point that we were looking at um, how to get them prepared for the next level. So each resident was given an opportunity to uh, do their resume over. So then we're going back to our numbers for this period of time. 
So obviously we saw some growth face to face, but we're still nowhere near where we were at in the summer. But we were also looking at expanding and reaching out to a broader spectrum of people. Now this is a key component because now we're looking at the visits. Now this tracks the whole time from 2014 to 2015. And as mentioned before, when we started, we were looking at how to increase the health spa visits. But we're also looking at a larger scale and more globally. So in September, when we happened to do all of our work, and kids were going back to school and getting physicals, we noticed that it spiked all the way up to 41. Then we began to see a decline as the weather began to change. That decline is one of the things that led to some of the changes in the community in terms of us being able to maintain it and keep it sustainable. Barriers. So community trust and advocacy. Although we've been out time and time again and we've told this neighbor three or four times, you still hear people saying, what is the health spot? <laughs> Why? When? When is it open? And so we had to look at how do we overcome that if we were to continue. And just being specific, if you look at where it was even located, although Friendly Inn was on the main street within the neighborhood, it was inside of a building, so it wasn't a storefront. There were all these different things that we had to deal with building trust. So when you look at community trust, I may trust UH, I may trust you, the community health worker, but I may not trust Friendly Inn, or vice versa. I may trust that if I go there, I'm going to actually end up going to the emergency, so I have my own practices for how I deal with my child's health. You're also looking at employee retention. So the advantage is, and we all say that, you know, if I do good work, I won't have a job. Well, in some cases, some of the residents were able to move forward to different opportunities. Some getting more engaged back in their school. Some actually taking on different jobs and opportunities. So now we're looking at retention. How do we build up and keep the momentum that we've already established? And as seen in the previous slide, health spot usage. So these are all the things that were looked at to kind of identify what is the progress, what are our lessons learned. And as some of us, we may look at only the uses of the health spot. Some of us may look at the value of the residents and how do we get all our partners to align. What are your priorities in terms of changing health and how do those priorities merge to create long-term sustainability? Now, I will mention that one of the things that I definitely learned throughout this project in terms of sustainability is longevity and so time frame. If we know that the neighborhood, it took some time for us to get in this position, we need more time in order to create the So, the question that And then in terms of sustainability, although the unit in the neighborhood closed, there were great opportunities for us to continue to explore how to enhance the, the residents' lives and livelihood. So as I mentioned, they all were given employment opportunities, which for many has transitioned to additional jobs and opportunities, both in health and other sectors. And then we had opportunities that were built with collaboration of Care Alliance. So Care Alliance to this day is still planning on hiring several of those residents because of their understanding of the neighborhood. And finally, Cleveland State. So Cleveland State has a community health worker program, which is a dual certificate program. So that program alone has caught the eye of many other community health workers. And now we already have 11 individuals from the community that are enrolled in that program occurring at Friendly Inn. So, that is primarily what happened. I will ask that Terry, Andre, and Peter come up in case questions go beyond my point in perspective. Thank you.
So I really do want to thank all of our speakers. I know it's quarter after. I think that they'd be willing to stick around and um, have some discussion if there are questions, but I recognize that some people may need to, to take off. Um, so if you do, you know, go ahead and do that, but let's, uh, let's have open it up to some questions. Mm -hmm. Can we more questions? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Should we just pass this mic yeah. thing? Okay. Yeah, it is well, pretty, pretty it might pretty be free. Don't think you okay. Yeah. I think it was over here. Yeah. Um, I know that the CSU class started recently, mm -hmm. but how did you design the training? Who made it and who like performed the training for this program? What was that? Okay. I don't want you to drop that. No. <laughs> so, um, so I designed the training um, really based on two things. One was looking at the need for the community health workers. And I have previous experience with developing community health worker curriculums um, prior to that. And so I really built off what I knew and some of the best practices out there. Um, so looked at the demographics of Central. I knew that. I looked at what the work they were going to be doing. So I was able to tailor the training specifically to what the needs were in Central. But because of when we entered in this particular program, there was not this real clarity of a from U8 side around very specific um, health protocols, what they needed. And so we had to actually leverage them to give that part of the training to make sure we followed the protocol per UH. I did not know that information. And so that's where partnership came in place in terms of any kind of protocols medically. Um, also making sure that we put in place, uh, if there was someone in the community, that they had someone they can call, like a nurse, that if they had some type of question that they could respond to. So I was aware, based on my history like, of developing the health worker program at Central, um, at, at St. Vincent, and knowing what needed to be in place. But curriculum-wise, as those topics, topics I've done and taught many times and used. And then also we were inclusive of community health workers. I mean, the others here, I got lean-in backgrounds, been done some work in the past, but we were able to look at some of their interests. And that's one of the things I also do. What is it that you want to talk about? Because we also need to, again, meet them where they are. Oh, so that's a question I do not have an answer for. Oh, so is it okay. Mm -hmm. All right. I have a big question. This is a question I think we've been talking about. We all need to get around the mic. <laughs> <laughs> I know that our group has been um, yeah. tangling with this because I think we're to the point now of understanding, sort of starting out where you started, Tony, I think, Peter, you particularly targeted, is that we all know that we have these. Um, we know that the funding comes in a certain way for things. Mm -hmm. So it's not like, I, I do feel like I want to push back a little bit, at least from the PRC's level, sure. mm -hmm. is that we've never been the one that says it's all about tenure and all this that. We're trying to figure mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. the same thing, and we know that we have the ability to bring sort of the resources through a vehicle, mm -hmm. right? The, the, the real challenge is, is that um, even if you have partners on the ground, which we have lots yes. and dozens and you know, probably hundreds at this point, it doesn't always still doesn't match mm -hmm. and I and so we know that what you said was absolutely on, on target is that once you do get the grant then there is all this you have to build that in right. right I'd like to challenge us in Cleveland to figure out a way to do something proactive mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so if there was a way of building like we, we've been talking a lot in, in, in this with the reach grant mm -hmm. like how do you build sort of a, a neighborhood based I'm just going to call it a team or a captain. We've been talking about these different models. Like, how do you build so that, that the neighborhoods themselves identify what they would be interested in investing in? Mm -hmm. And then, so that when then institutions, let's call it institutions, when these opportunities come through, you're not getting the grant and then going. Mm -hmm. You're then saying, great, neighborhood A, B, C, and D is interested in this. Let's go together and write this grant mm -hmm. together. Mm -hmm. So that everybody's at the beginning of it. Because I do think there's a perception that we wait and we don't do. Mm -hmm. That's not really the case. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a matter of there being, there's a mismatch in the way these things mm -hmm. are coming forward. And there are other communities that have figured this out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Here we, I think we figure it out in spaces. Like I'm looking at Darcy, but like mm -hmm. around food, I think there's now finally like it's kind of you got to have an understanding of where the folks are they're willing and able to do mm -hmm. work at the neighborhood level for some of these things mm -hmm. but for a lot of things there's not and 
Anyway, so yeah. you, you got a feeling in there? The I have a comment too. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I just want to ask you. You want a complex to come? I know this Bobby Corps here. I'm excited with them. But, but I, I think that's a, a great point. I will tell you, in the work that I do as a project manager for the greater university circle uh, a community health initiative so i partner my partner is um jackie matley mm -hmm. of course you keep reading prayers what she's enduring um we did just that we did a qualitative study with the um with the health initiative we're focusing on infant mortality and health mm -hmm. and let it be in and so what we did before we even tried to put a um a um um, um, the word out. The program together, we talked to over 100 people, 100 people in the communities that surround mm -hmm. UC, mm -hmm. and um, to actually build that trust because uh, you have to shift the cultural, yeah. the cultural thinking on both sides of the spectrum. You have an institution, you have a community, and they both have their opinion about each other and once we did that we are now collaborating we have um for infant mortality we have co-chairs uh Lejeune ray from family mm -hmm. center mm -hmm. and kim foreman mm -hmm. and then for infant mortality we have um, mm -hmm. uh, heidi garland mm -hmm. and um i'm sorry heidi garland and Lejeune ray for infant mortality and kim foreman for kim alive mary mother who's at the Labor Foundation mm -hmm. for lead. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right, because I do know about the health spot, and I always thought that the Friendly Inn could have done a better job, I thought, of marketing. You use that word, marketing. I didn't, the, the building sits off the street, and I thought when I was involved that I, I just didn't think the, the um, Friendly Inn did a great job of helping market it, because sometimes it would close early, and the way the building is, is set up, they, they would shutter the building. And unless you knew it was there, you didn't know it was there. Because the building sits off the street. And to Joe's point, there's a lot of, he didn't go into detail, but there's a lot of reason why people don't come that far up. There's boundaries, there's gangs, there's all these things where people who can walk to the place would do it. But going back to your point, I think you should have a plan in place and then go get funding because we just submitted our budget for funding for this year after doing exactly what you just said. Well, let me, uh, so, so from a research standpoint, you know, having participated in CBPR, I think that the foundation is already written. I think when you look at the work of Meredith Minkler and some of Barbara, um, I'm going to forget her last name. When you look at particularly our indigenous community, our Native American councils, the, the formation of what you need to do to me is there. Um, I think... I'm not talking, let me make sure, we, we are all real invested in, in CBPR. We understand right. that I still, the reason I'm taking this advantage is I think we, it's a different level. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of saying, it's not the how to do it. Mm -hmm. It's really more to the how to do it in the framework of the way maybe funding comes. Maybe that's another, because I think on the ground, I would say in this case, the institutions and the residents, we all are on the same page. Mm -hmm. It's that we don't get to control how we do this. We, as a PRC, we have no money that we could just mm -hmm. say, let's go develop all these things. We have to somehow figure out how to marry things. We all have the same mission. We mm -hmm. have a vision of what we want to sure. see happen at the, at the neighborhood level. But it's not as though we have a big foundation of money that we can say, here is, let's figure out how to do this. We've got to figure out how to partner. And I still, I tend to think partner means it's funny because your, your definition was the opposite of the way I think of it. I think of collaboration as just being groups of people coming together. Our partners say, we both come in, we're going to do this, and we're, 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 we are equal partners in how we do this. So, so don't, don't go to the... I well, well, here's, here's the point. You're pushing back, but, but here's what I heard you say. You say you're saying you don't know how to necessarily partner. You're saying you have a source of money that's coming in that you don't have control of. But at the same time, you're saying, you know, how do we come together with residents and look at what their interests are? At least that's... So, so help me understand the question again, because maybe I'm missing... Well, the two, the two things that... I no, no, you got to have a mic, got to have a mic, mic. mic. got to have a mic, sorry. The two things that um, kind of rose up for me after you made your comment was really back to the two points I was trying to make around connecting the dots, and I think the other piece is leadership. So there's interconnectedness in all of this, right? So we all sit at a different 
point in the spectrum in trying to implement big ideas and drive change, right? Um, so it's um, so with that understanding, there's again these tensions. So there's a tension around funding. What are the sources? What are the opportunities? How can we leverage that? To what extent can we do something with those resources, right? So it's not like you're completely unhinged and able to just do what ever your heart's desire. I think we're all sensitive to that. And even as someone who sat as a funder, I still had a lot of restrictions around what dollars could do, who I could bring into the fold as a partner, as a collaborator, what was okay to fund. You know, so we're always going to have some level of limitation. I think where there's opportunity going forward um, is first of all around connecting the dots. So I love the notion of being proactive. I think that is definitely a space we have to get to. I think also in being proactive is to somewhat unburden yourself in terms of how are we going to pay for it, but to really be vested in what are we going to solve and how, yes. you, know, you understand what I'm saying? And so I just come from a mindset that the money will come if we can get the house in order in order to do what it is that we're trying to solve. Yeah, pay the money. The money, I'm sorry. Right. No, it's okay. Because so, it's really about the shared vision. Right. And so that requires leadership at a lot of yeah. different levels. And I think it really requires a conversation to shift in a way that it hasn't occurred before. So even to, this, to those who hold the resources, there's a real conversation mm -hmm. that has to happen happen there? Who's going to be that advocate, that champion, that team of folks who's going to engage at that level? Who's going to have the conversation at the partner level and say, okay, here's what I care about, here's what you care about, here's the geography we're looking at, how do we bring this all to, you know, to connect? So for me, the two vital points in getting to that transition is really around leadership and connecting the dots. The funding will come um, and like right now what I'm experiencing in this new role, we have a whole new generation of wealth that's being brought into society to solve problems and tr the reality is, is that they're not too fond of how we've been going about it so people are kind of out here doing it their own way whether they want to dig wells in Africa whether they want to put a laptop you know in every young girl's hands that's in Afghanistan I mean they're really thinking contrary to how we've done things and so part of what I'm challenged with going forward in my new work is to figure out how to not only understand where they're coming coming from, but also to help them align and connect to how they can wield their wealth yeah. to really drive change and not just do something that's trendy or exciting for the time. Mm -hmm. Does that, does that yeah. kind of get it with your... So, so I'm glad you, you brought that up because that goes back to that side when I say having the courage to do something different. So I, has, I couldn't quite understand when you're talking about the foundation because I'm so used to looking at, and I think about Hip C right now, yeah. creating greater destinies. There's an infrastructure right. brewing from that side. Yes. But at the end of the day, yes, it, I do agree that leadership has to think differently and you have to think outside of your norm. And I think that's part of what you're saying. So if you're a researcher, you're going to process and think about this side of university, mm -hmm. give me, you know, and support me by doing X, Y, and Z based on university protocol. Well, yeah, I started thinking differently. Where's the advocacy going up and across the board? And also with partners, because I do think there's plenty of partners who will be ready to partner. But I also think just like we plan for a grant five years, like I could think about Cuyahoga County, you know, two years down the road, right, we're starting to write and start. It's no different than starting to think the shift, shift the difference, get the people in the room, and go from there. But I think it goes back to your point about disruption. Mm -hmm. yep. I mean, and, I, and I think it, it's disruption that comes from the leader inside sure. whatever context they're in sure. mm -hmm. as well as the disruption from the leader on the outside. So I think you need that disruption to happen mm -hmm. and I think often what happens when disruption starts, yeah. we run. Mm -hmm. So it's like, oh, I don't need to take, I'm take my money and go. I'm going to take my people and go. So we yeah. need to be willing to, to to stand through the disruption to get right. to the other side. Right. See, but I'm, I would say, but we don't run. We're not running right now. That's what I'm trying to say. You may not run. No, no, but that's what I'm trying to you ask. I'm saying, like, I'm not. I know. That's what I'm trying to say. I want to push this conversation to where let's let's assume that we're not running because I think we're not hitting something that really is happening, which is that first of all. We all talk about the community as if it's one big thing. And mm -hmm. if you, like, right, I mean, mm -hmm. even now, and let's do reach. We've got residents on the ground doing work. Mm -hmm. 
but there are residents in those same communities that don't think they represent them. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. so for somebody who's looking at it from my end, this gets pretty complex to figure out sure. how to figure who are we partnering with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's a there's a bigger, I don't know if it's philosophical, I don't know if it's conceptual, mm -hmm. but there's something else that's missing here that, that's not about participatory. We get the participatory part. But I think in some ways we're wasting a, we waste a lot of time because we miss the line from the get go. <coughs> and if we could figure out a way to proactively mm -hmm. be able to understand where the alignments could be, I think we would get further faster. I don't know. I'm just maybe I'm not articulating this very well, but it's it's a problem, and it's going to continue to be a problem because everybody is invested in wanting to do it this way. But the end result, we're not getting anywhere. Right. Well, okay. we're, we're spinning right now, I think. And I, I think part of what, I'll say this and I'm going to let Joe, Joe speak. Now, it's interesting, as I hear you continue to talk, the question I would have, and you don't have to respond to this because I want Joe, I think he got something to say, is how are you defining success? Right. And so I think that's the question here because, you know, particularly when you talked about residents being represented and not some, not feeling represented, well, guess what? That's, that is going to be an outcome, you know, of most dynamics but the question is what are the majority of people talking about but but let Joe jump in here I'm just I'd like to let Joe have the last last sure. comment on this one and I, yeah. I, want, I want to thank everybody really quick yeah, on this great. Thank discussion you. and I wonder if from this there's another conversation yeah I really would love for the panel I'm not quite sure if I put my finger on what that would be sure. but yeah. if folks want to think about that mm -hmm. a little bit more right. whether it's I agree. this kind of a panel or another kind of group discussion it sounds like it's a really rich thing to dig into. Okay, thanks. And so I'll make my comment quick and I'll say just from my perspective, I think part of our gap is, is the difference between institutions and residents and the needs that both of them want to align. And so for me, I think the question that I just throw out there now with an answer is what does it mean for residents to lead and how is their leadership leading us to money? And so that's, that's kind of how I interpreted that. And yeah. No, I don't. He said, what is, it, what is it for residents to lead, and how is their leadership leading us to money? That's really powerful. That's why he got the last. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.